And with that, once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to LA Birders webinar for November 28th. And we are really uh, privileged to have our presenter today and to present our presenter, we have Andy Birch. Andy, if you can take Thank it from you. here. So Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Amar Ayash with us tonight. Amar is a leading expert on gull identification and an evangelist for gull recreation. Amar lives in Northern Illinois where he's been teaching high school mathematics for 20 years. In his free time, Amar is either writing about gulls or traveling the world to photograph and study this fascinating group of birds. Interestingly, Amar says one of his most memorable birding experiences was his first trip to Southern California, where he spent a few days birding the Salton Sea with the godfather of California birding, Guy McCaskey. Amar says that during their long car rides, he was briefed on 40 years of birding in the Golden State with some of the most entertaining birding stories one could ever hear. Today, Amar coordinates the Illinois Ornithological Society's annual gull frolic, which takes place on the shores of Lake Michigan. He hosts the well-known gull website, anythinglaris.com, and also administers the Facebook group, North American Gulls. Amar has published a number of articles and papers on gulls, including most recently a paper on malt in Peruvian kelp gulls in the latest issue of Western Birds. Amar is affiliated with several gull banding programs throughout North America and is frequently found speaking at birding events across the country. Amar is currently in the last stages of completing his upcoming book, The Gull Guide, and we eagerly await its publication. Without further ado, please welcome Amar Ayash. Wow. Uh, thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. And thank you, Ron and Mark. I'm going to share my screen here. And if my volume is not up to par, please somebody yell at me and let me know if volume. Um... Volume is great. Good. Um, so LA Birders, November 2023, getting to know your gulls. This was a hard yeah. talk for me to put together. Amar, I'm still waiting for your um, presentation. Club. Okay. Let's get this shared here. Oh, unless you were playing not <laughs> doing that <laughs> yet. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so no, let me, let me share this and I hope I have, and any second now, folks. How's that? Looking good. Good, I think. Uh, uh, now it looks great. Thanks. Excellent. So, um, yeah, this is a hard talk for me to put together um, bits and pieces of things that I thought, what would interest birders from Southern California while, um, you know, giving a broad overview of getting to know your gulls. Um, this first slide here might seem a little bit intimidating, but um, I do want to garner some interest in Thinking about young birds, young birds um, kind of are the crux of large gull identification because there's so much uh, variation and so much to think about with these younger age groups. Uh, but if you're just beginning with gull identification, your focus should probably be adults. Um, this evening, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a bird can go from this as a juvenile uh, to this in a matter of three and a half to four years. Um, I'm sure you guys recognize these species here. These are all species you can see in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not really sure which one is more rare at this point, slatyback gull or lesser blackback gull in Los Angeles. Um, but I know there's Lady been back, a topic. No. Is it, is it slatyback? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So a Andrew Birch seems to have found uh, a ton of these lesser blackbacks in the last few years. And um, I'll talk about their east to west expansion and and um, why we may be seeing more of these in the west now. Um, but, you know, when we when we think about gulls, let's just get this out of the way. Uh, we're generally talking about two groups of birds. We're talking about the large white headed gulls, everybody's favorite uh, things like Western gull and California gull and then the smaller turn -like gulls, Bonaparte's. Uh, little gull. And um, 
if you would um, start to think of these things as two year, three year and four year goals. And I'm going to use a synonym here instead of two year, I'm going to say two cycle, three cycle and four cycle goal. A two cycle goal such as Bonaparte's is a bird that um, is going to have one year of immature plumage and then the second year is going to start to molt into its adult plumage. Uh, a three-year gall such as ring build will have two years of immature plumage and then the third year will start to molt into this adult-like plumage. Interestingly, yellow-footed gull, which happens to be a large gull, is a three-cycle gull. And I'll talk more about yellow-footed gull uh, once we start comparing these things to Western gulls in a few slides. And then four-year gulls are going to have three years of immature plumages and then their fourth cycle they start to show this adult-like plumage. Um, the small turn-like gulls overall, um, a lot of people, especially beginning bird watchers, are thrilled to see things like sabins gulls and ivory gulls and even experienced birders um, wouldn't mind leaving the house to go see one of these small turn-like gulls. Among them, as you guys know, are some of the most coveted bird species in the world. We have uh, things like Ross's gull, um, in alternate plumage here or breeding plumage. Um, Ross's gull happens to have the smallest bill of all gulls. Uh, just a beautiful Arctic species. Ivory gull, uh, black legs, grayish yellow bill, uh, all white plumage is a spectacular ice loving gull. Uh, little gulls, kind of a recent addition to North America. And by recent, I mean like the last hundred years. Uh, it's migrated across the Atlantic, and now um, there's somewhere in the ballpark of about 400 pairs that are thought to breed in North America. Um, but um, little gull has no eye crescents. It's just all black-faced and a dark eye. Uh, notice this black here on the underwing. Uh, and my favorite, Sabin's gull or Sabine's gull or Sabine's gull, um, which will probably see a name change in the not-so-distant future, uh, I just learned a couple days ago, literally two days ago, of this individual here. Uh, notice the band on the leg here, folks. This banded adult Sabin's gull uh, was banded in 1999 on Southampton Island. And just this past July, Brendan Kelly, who was doing shorebird work, uh, found this bird, recorded the band number, and, and found out that this thing is 24 years old. It's uh, a phenomenal sighting. It's rich with data. Um, this bird was found literally in the same colony where it was banded as a nestling in 1999. So from 1999 to 2023, um, amazing longevity record, um, amazing site fidelity record. Um, but Sabin's gulls, um, as you may know, are long distance migrants. This is our longest migrating gull. Uh, back in 2016, there was a study where they fitted adults with geo trackers and um, found that a mated pair actually had this divergent migratory pathway where one adult wintered on the Pacific Ocean and the other adult wintered on the Atlantic Ocean. And um, the following breeding season, these birds migrated back north, regrouped, and uh, were found breeding again in the same colony the following year. Um, so there's definitely some site fidelity, and it's thought that uh, what trumps these these locations and being selected is um, just the habitat above all. Um, Sabins, unlike things like Iceland gulls, tend to stick around their breeding range and their breeding grounds uh, for years on end. Um, Iceland gulls, on the other hand, have been found to breed somewhere for a decade or so and then completely vacate that area after 10, 15 years. And that's what makes studying Iceland gulls so difficult is um, they're a moving target. They're a moving target. They may be on Southampton Island this year and then five years from now be nowhere to be found there. Uh, Brendan Kelly, who, who did this uh, shorebird survey this past summer, didn't see any Iceland gulls on Southampton Island. Uh, which is phenomenal because the only data we have really of Iceland gulls hybridizing is a study from Southampton Island where they were found hybridizing in the mid-1980s, and those birds are all but gone now. 
at any rate, um, these small turn light galls, um, as you guys, let me turn this laser pointer off. These small turn light galls don't present many identification challenges. The amount of variation isn't so striking that it would be difficult to tell these things apart in the field. You have some that are so diagnostic, like this adult little gull um, with the black underwing. There's also another little gull in this same slide. Can anyone see that other little gull? It's a first cycle little gull. If you look about four birds to the left, um, not so easy in a flock of Bonapartes, but this individual right here, can you guys see my cursor? Are yes, we to... yes, we yeah. can. All right, because if, if I zoom in, then my highlighter turns off. But okay, as long as you can see the cursor. So um, these first cycle little gulls, if you notice the wingtip here has black on the underside of the outer primaries versus the white that you're going to find on these Bonapartes. Um, but overall, above all, the field guides do a pretty good job describing these two-year gulls and three-year gulls. Um, in, in Europe, I think they call these W patterns or M patterns. But if you notice across the upper wing on these first cycles, they have this dark carpal bar. And they're all kind of unique in their own way. Bonaparte's in the middle here um, has this break in the carpal bar where it has these white headlights uh, it has a black trailing edge from the body all the way to the wingtip. Uh, Little Gull has a very thick carpal bar, kind of this squarish tail band. And um, Kitty Wakes, Kitty Wakes are a bit larger, and these are three-year gulls. Um, they tend to keep this broad hind collar. They show no pigment on the trailing edge. Um, and they rarely have this break in the carpal bar. It's usually continuous black hair. Um, a step up from these guys are the hooded gulls, Franklin's, Laughing Gull. Uh, these are three-year species, and um, they tend to be more coastal. If you notice um, the white partition here on Franklin's gull, that's called a medial band, and that's a nice way to separate these adults from Laughing Gull when they're in basic plumage. But also a unique thing about Franklin's gulls that many people don't know is the upper tail. The upper tail on many adults is gray or has some grayish wash. So one of the suggested names for this, we were talking about prairie gull before the talk. Uh, one of the suggested names is gray-tailed gull. And this is our only gull that shows gray on the tail as an adult. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, you'll notice that these hooded gulls, um, they have white on the trailing edge. Um, and that's a little different than the masked gulls, things like Bonapartes and black-headed. They don't have white trailing edges. It's just all gray. Um, at any rate, at first cycle, you take something like Franklin's gull, it's always going to average more black on the head than laughing gull. And, um, you know, I should have done my homework. I'm not sure which one you're more likely to see in L.A., but I know in the Salton Sea, it's much more likely that you would see a laughing gull with this long droopy bill. There is some variation in the bills of laughing gulls. If you notice, this one here has a smallish bill. Um, there's a Caribbean subspecies of laughing gull that tends to be a little bit larger. Uh, this was taken in Florida in January by Michael Brothers. And they occasionally get these one or two Franklin's gulls and these massive flocks of laughing gulls. Um, laughing gulls off the eastern Florida coast uh, and Daytona Beach shores can be found literally in the tens of thousands. There's some flocks that have been estimated at over 100,000 birds wintering there, being the largest, largest winter flock of laughing gulls you can find in North America. So it's nice when you can pick out one or two Franklin's gulls in those, in those big flocks of laughing gulls. So, um, it's quite obvious when they're in alternate plumage versus basic plumage. These are laughing gulls, by the way. Uh, notice the eye crescent here in the back usually is not connected at the back of the eye. The bill tends to be a little bit larger, droopier than Franklin's. Um, some people may call this breeding plumage on the right here, um, but that's a little bit different. I'll talk about the distinction there. And basic plumage on the left here. Um, I don't use the words breeding and non-breeding plumage. I kind of reserve that for 
what's known as an aspect. So like this California gull on the right here has a breeding aspect and it is in high breeding condition. And much of that is tied to what the bear parts look like, what the bill looks like, what the leg color looks like. And even the, the skin around the eye, this orbital ring, when this thing starts to flare up and becomes really bright and vivid, and this gate patch here at the base of the mouth, when you see these colors at their brightest, we say that this bird is in high breeding condition or it has a breeding aspect. And it just so happens to coincide with alternate plumage. So it has a white head generally when it has the brightest bare parts. Um, whereas an individual like this on the left here on the far left is in low breeding condition or non-breeding condition. The bare parts are dull. Um, there's no indication of what the orbital color looks like. And it just so happens to coincide with basic plumage. Basic plumage here has all this head streaking that you generally see on these white-headed gulls. The individual in the middle is kind of interesting because its bare parts are somewhat bright. I could see the orbital color, but it's also in basic plumage at this time. So I wouldn't say this bird uh, is in breeding plumage. I wouldn't say it was in breeding condition. It's just kind of in limbo here between um, the winter season and the breeding season. Uh, orbital color can be quite useful in identification. Uh, if you see this Iceland gull on the bottom here has this kind of gaudy pinkish orbital ring. And this herring gull on the top here has this kind of chrome yellow orbital ring. Some species that have yellow orbital rings would be like Western gull, um, some glaucus gulls, some kelp gulls. And then species with pinkish orbital rings are things like slatyback gull, um, glaucus wing gull, and the Iceland gulls. If you see red orbital rings, these are things like California gull, uh, ring-billed gull, and um, maybe short-billed gull or mu gull. And of course, vega gull has red orbital color. These can be really useful in identification. You know, if you're unsure about something, it could be just one extra piece that helps you take that ID to the next level. Um, something weird happens with Western gulls. I'm sure you guys are aware of this. Right at the onset of the breeding season, around April, May, um, adults tend to take on this yellowish leg color. It's not very common, but it's also not rare. Uh, I'm not sure what percentage of adults show this, but it always trips people up in thinking they might have a yellow-footed gull or maybe a kelp gull or something. But if you look at the leg color here, this is, again, almost always April, May. Um, you know, Western gull in general tends to have a really bright yellow bill. But on these individuals where the leg color isn't correct, they tend to have um, this hyper vivid leg color and bill color. But the legs aren't quite mustard yellow like this yellow-footed gull on the left here. This is a yellow-footed gull at the Salton Sea with a western gull, which happens to be increasing at the Salton Sea. Uh, notice sex for sex, male yellow-footeds almost always have deeper bill tips. And they almost always have a larger goni spot. This red spot that we're seeing here tends to be a little bit larger in yellow-footed gull when compared to western gull. Um, this one is a non-breeding condition. This is September, by the way, and these birds are molting their outer primaries right now. But again, to go back to this thing, um, if you haven't encountered one in Los Angeles or in your region, uh, you probably will at some point. Just keep in mind, uh, is it you know April, May? And um, is there any explanation for why that's happening? Um, there's no study, actually, that's that's talked about why this happens, why they get this wrong leg color. Uh, some people think it's diet related. Others think it's some hormonal episode because it's happening at the start of the breeding season. Uh, but nobody really knows exactly what mechanism is controlling this thing. Um, so you notice this uh, darker Western gull here. This is probably Wymanized subspecies. The subspecies you guys have is the darker subspecies. They tend to be really similar to yellow-footed gull. And so... Um, when we try to quantify these things, we use the Kodak grayscale. So if you're reading some of the gull literature, uh, this is the scale that we use to try to measure these things. And it's based on a zero to 19 scale. 
uh, zero being all white. The only gall that gets a zero is ivory gall. And then this jet black here, uh, maybe some of the kelp galls, some of the lesser black back galls are worthy of an 18, 19, but it's very rare. Uh, great black back is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 13. Okay, slaty back gall is in the 10 to 13 neighborhood. But these three, we should know these three, uh, in the foreground is an adult California gull. And that one is scoring about a seven and a half on the Kodak gray scale. Notice it has a dark eye. Um, it has grayish green legs. This is low breeding condition. The herring gull in the center here has a pale eye, um, pale upper part. So that's a four there. And then the glaucus wing, I'm not sure if this is a pure glaucus wing. It might be. Uh, it's somewhere about a six on the Kodak gray scale. And so these numbers are, are pretty consistent. Uh, I've measured and, and scaled hundreds and hundreds of these in museum collections. And they are pretty consistent in pure birds if you're dealing with a pure bird. Now, there's some variation at the subspecies and species level. Um, both of these individuals are California gulls. They have this black to red pattern on the bill in low breeding condition. Um, the basic head pattern with all the streaking, but notice they have yellow legs, dark eyes. They're just typical California gulls. The one on the right here may be um, from the Alberta subspecies in Canada, kind of paler, bigger. Um, just for reference here, this is a herring gull in the back here. And so notice how similar they can be, uh, which is pretty interesting for California gull to be that large and pale. The darker subspecies in the Great Basin region um, this is what you guys probably would see also in the, in the um, breeding season. They're darker, they're smaller overall. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting to see this from, you know, anywhere from October through March. You can go on in a beach here and try to compare some of these California gulls and their gray Kodak scale values. Now, nobody really uses these numbers in the field, so nobody's going to say this western gull in the front is a Kodak grayscale 13, and the one in the back is a 10. Um, this is mainly reserved for things in writing or when we're comparing photos online. But, um, you know, some nice variation here with western gulls, both of these being um, about the same size, both have darkish eyes. Uh, the individual in the back is probably nominate occidentalis, the northern subspecies. These things breed um, from, say, central California north, and then the darker subspecies, Wymanai, uh, once you get into like San Luis Obispo and points south of there, would be this darker race that you guys are used to seeing. Even among Thayer's gulls, there's some variation in the gray upper parts. Um, let me just point this out here. This uh, Thayer's on the right here is a typical Thayer's, kind of a medium gray, pale gray upper parts. Um, but this one here is a lighter one. And this was taken in British Columbia in March. Um, you know, what we make of birds like this, why is this Thayer's so pale? You know, Thayer's scores anywhere from a five to six on the Kodak gray scale. So this just might be normal variation. Um, on the Great Lakes, our Thayer's gulls tend to be paler, like this here, closer to herring gull. Uh, and when you go out west, it's it's more common to see them a little bit darker like this. These other birds in the background here, guys, glaucus wing type. This is a glaucus wing type, maybe a hybrid with western. Uh, Short-billed gulls here, another Thayer's gull. Um, glaucus gulls, all white-winged. Uh, beautiful, large white-winged gulls our second largest gull in the world, but there's also variation uh, within the populations. This one on the right here is likely Barovianus subspecies uh, in the North Slope around Barrow. This is the smallest population of Glaucus gull. They tend to be the darkest also. So this gray here is, is not pale gray, as you see in this adult on the left. Uh, the subspecies that's found in Central Canada, Arctic Canada, um, east of Alaska would be Lucerettes, um, and they're they're some of the largest glaucus gulls. And in time, these two might prove to be different species. These glaucus gulls actually may be genetically distinct. Uh, even the lesser blackback gulls, which is um, increasing all throughout the interior and west, there's some variation in their upper parts. Remarkable variation. 
So these adults here, this adult one, two, three, four, they seem like typical Grailsii Dutch intergrades. Um, but this one here on the right is a bit paler. And so there's this question of how pale is too pale for lesser blackback gull. And I just draw this random line in the sand from watching hundreds of these in Florida. Um, I say, you know, if it's lesser blackback, if it's laughing gall color, I think it's okay. These laughing galls in the foreground are about the same shade. I would call this a safe lesser blackback gall. Uh, but any paler than that, such as this individual here, it looks to be about a half shade paler than these laughing galls. This one is kind of suspicious. Even the bill and the face and the head, just everything about it reeks of herring gull, and that's a growing hybrid on the Atlantic. You can find these great uh, lesser blackback herrings now in places like Florida, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, North Carolina, St. John's, Newfoundland. It's just a matter of time, really, uh, before they expand to the West, I think, um, which will give you guys some more hybrids to think about. Um, so uh, the takeaway from this was the variation in gray upper parts can be remarkable in some species, lesser blackbacks, western gulls, glaucus gulls. Um, but there are some species where we don't expect any variation in the gray upper parts. And those are things like herring gulls. Um, herring gulls with darker or lighter upper parts are almost always accused of being hybrids. Um, we tend to not see any variation in their upper parts. Okay, uh, to move this along here, we got to get into some of the good stuff, the topography and some of the molt nomenclature. Um, this individual here is a juvenile or first basic lesser blackback gull. This is just one of many aspects these juvenile lesser blackback gulls can have. Uh, when you're looking at a first cycle like this, a young bird, some of the useful tracks to look at are the greater coverts the tertials, and the tail band. Um, those are usually revealing enough to help direct you towards a subspecies or species that you want to, to pin down. Um, these longest feathers here, guys, these are flight feathers for anybody new to uh, looking at gulls. This is not the tail. These are the fingers, if you will, the longest flight feathers. It's sometimes helpful to look at the underside of the far wing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But notice this tail band here. There's a white tail base. Uh, the tail band is pretty typical with a white tail base. Some of these old world taxa like lesser blackbacks, uh, vega gulls, European herring gulls, they tend to have whitish vents or they're paler hair than say the American herring gull and um, Thayer's gulls and such. Um, when these birds start to molt, when they start to lose their juvenile plumage, the scapulars, these large feathers on the back here, are usually the first feathers to be replaced. And so I ask, how would you age these birds? How would you categorize their molt? Uh, it's October, Oregon. These are California gulls. Um, the one in the foreground here, we would call a juvenile, or it's in largely in juvenile plumage. It has this single scapular replaced, but overall it's a juvenile. But this individual here, has undergone a good amount of molt in the scapulars. Notice these barred, contrasty scapulars. There's also some median coverts that have been replaced here. There's this molt gap here at the inner greater covert. So this bird is in molt right now, and it's undergoing what we call the first pre-alternate molt. And it's going to acquire an alternate plumage from this molt. Uh, similarly, this individual in the back, this is another first cycle California gull, and just compare the, the post-juvenile feathers, these gray feathers, to these barred feathers. Such a difference in appearance, and this is some of that variation that you see in these first cycle birds. Um, this bird has replaced more median coverts. It has these really dark centered feathers on the scapulars, but nonetheless, these are first cycles. All of them are first cycles. The only one I would call a juvenile is the bird in the foreground because it hasn't undergone any substantial molt. Um, a similar thing we can talk about with ring-billed gulls. Both of these birds were photographed uh, on Lake Michigan in August. And 
the one on the left I would call a juvenile. It's in first basic plumage. These are the feathers that it grew in a nest. These are the feathers that it fledged with. It's first set of true feathers. We would call this a juvenile. On the right here is also a first cycle ring-billed gull. Same age cohort, um, but it's undergone a fairly extensive first pre-alternate molt. It's replaced a lower tertial here, some median coverts. Most of its scapulars have been replaced. So these are pretty advanced adult-like gray scapulars. Um, for people who use seasons to age their gulls, people would call this a first winter ring-billed gull, but that's not very intuitive seeing that the season is summer still. This is August. And um, you know, for people who subscribe to seasons, they would call this thing a first winter. Um, and it is sort of imprecise. Um, a nice comparison to be made here, this is a short-billed gull or a mew gull in the foreground. They tend not to replace any tertials or wing coverts for the entire time that we see them here on the non-breeding grounds. Whereas this ring-billed in the background has replaced some tertials, some upper tertials, some inner coverts. So um, not that I would ever need molt to tell these birds apart. It's just an interesting observation to see more local short-term or short distance migrants replacing more feathers and this more long distant migrant replacing less feathers. Uh, compare the bills. I think there's some lens compression going on here. This, this bird just appears way too bulky and big for a ring build. And birds in the background usually are gonna look a little bit larger when you use a, um, a zoom lens. Short billed gull on the neck here, it has kind of this smudged appearance here. This is kind of useful if you're trying to distinguish between, say, short-billed gull and common gull from Europe, or even short-billed gull and Kamchatka gull. Um, so to kind of quiz yourself here, these are all short-billed gulls, all mew gulls, birds you're seeing on the coasts now. Um, only one of these is a juvenile. Although they're all first cycle, the only one we would call a juvenile is the bird from August in Alaska that's still holding on to all of its juvenile upper parts. But now this January bird from San Francisco, let's zoom in a little bit, it's replaced some scapulars. So this bird is undergoing its first pre-alternate molt, or it could be called a first alternate short-billed gull. Similarly, the bird from March here, and even this individual, I think this was Los Angeles, I want to say April, um, it's still a first cycle. It's replaced most of its scapulars, but no wing coverts. And I would call this bird a first alternate, a first alternate short-billed gull. So a takeaway here is, and when you go back and rewind this and, and listen to this again, uh, please pause this and take this to heart here. Every juvenile is a first cycle, but not every first cycle is a juvenile, right? So um, with the large white-headed gulls, there are some that seem to replace those scapulars in earnest, like these three herring gulls here. If you look closely at their scapulars, there's a good amount of contrast. These are second generation scapulars on this individual as well. Even this dark blotchy area on the flanks, those are new first alternate feathers. Um, but on the stayers gull, stayers tend to keep their scapulars for most of the non-breeding season when we see them here. Um, it's, it's a good observation to make. Uh, you're not expecting a lot of contrast on the back. It's sort of this uniform appearance. But also notice on the Thayers, the primaries are often pale edged. They're not so contrasty and dark as you would find in, in some of these herring gulls. So the, the contrast between the primaries and the tertials is a smoother contrast. Whereas in herring gulls, it's more of an abrupt and darker contrast. Um, Glaucus gull in first cycle tends to be one of those long distance migrants that doesn't replace much of its juvenile feathers. Uh, this is January, Florida. This is a first cycle Glaucus gull. And by and large, it's still juvenile. So there, there are no scapulars that are replaced, no wing coverts. And again, those people who subscribe to Seasons would probably call this a first winter Glaucus gull, but it hasn't acquired a new plumage from juvenile plumage. So 
it's it's kind of imprecise to give this thing a label based on a plumage that it hasn't really acquired. So Glaucus gulls, they'll, they'll actually stay here um, until about March and then migrate back north to the breeding grounds in these juvenile plumages. And it's thought that some of them will go from one basic plumage to the next, which is pretty unique among gulls to not have any inserted molt. The only other gull that does this is ivory gull. They go from one basic plumage to the next. And so some glaucus gulls may also do this. All right, open wing topography. Um, the, the longest flight feathers are gonna be primaries, uh, secondaries. And I wanna get into this because I'm gonna start showing some more open wings and start discussing some of the nitty gritty of wingtip patterns. Um, these, these flight feathers, these secondaries, gulls have anywhere from 16 to 23 um, primaries, 10 primaries. The innermost feathers here are tertials. And think, think of these cupboards as just, you know, kind of arrayed, sitting in this array of, of shingle-like patterns to cover the bases of the flight feathers. They're there to protect the flight feathers, to streamline the wing. I'm not sure this is a gull's wing. If it was, P10 would be longer, P9 would be longer. And when people are, are talking about gull wing tips, it's usually anywhere from P5 to P10 where all the action is happening. Uh, P1 to P4 are usually plain and unmarked. Um, but these feathers are just numbered sequentially from P1 outwardly to P10. We'll do a little quiz here. You can quiz yourself at home. I can't hear any of you, but um, let's start with eight. These are the tertials. Four are the secondaries. One, the primary feathers. Uh, nine, those are scapular. So those are the back feathers. They're going to close that gap between the back and the upper wing. Uh, five are greater coverts. Six, median coverts. And seven are the lesser or marginal coverts. And then two are uh, the primary coverts. So these are protecting the bases of the primaries. And a bonus here, number three is the alula or allula. This is kind of like the rudder that's that's steering the uh, and 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 controlling kind of the flight when this bird is slowing down or trying to churn. Um, so now that we have a little bit of this open wing down, uh, let's look at this first cycle yellow-footed gull. These are exciting birds because they tend to have more extensive pre-alternate molts. You could see a molt limit right here on the greater cover track. Um, these newer grayer feathers are first alternate, and these browner older ones are juvenile. And yellow-footed, as we said earlier, is kind of this unique large gull in that they acquire adult plumage within about three years. Uh, and the reason for this is because they replace so many upper parts. They replace a number of tertials and tail feathers. Um, see the contrast here on these first alternate tail feathers. Western gulls don't do this. You wouldn't find a Western gull with these many wing coverts replaced. Western gulls don't replace tail feathers in their first pre-alternate molt. So a bird like this would really catch my attention if I saw it on the coast somewhere. The question you should ask is, so when does a gull become a second cycle? We know what first cycles are. You know, how long into its life is it now a second cycle? So a cycle is, is it aligns with an annual um, process. And this happens at about one year of age. This bird will start to drop its innermost primaries. If you see this gap here, P1 and P2 are missing. We can safely say this bird is now in its second molt cycle. It's beginning a complete molt. It's starting flight feather molt. Um, although it looks a lot like a first cycle, um, it would be more correct for us to call this thing a second cycle. It's undergoing its second complete molt, which is known as a second pre-basic molt. And in a complete molt like this, every feather track will see some molt, the greater coverts, the secondaries, the tail feathers. If you notice here, the inner primaries, these are new primaries, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. These four outer primaries, these are first basic, they're juvenile. But these molts, these complete molts typically begin around May and it'll continue molting until about October. It's about a five, six month process. This is a Thayer's gull in June on Lake Michigan. Um, you can see the contrast here. These are newer inner primaries. They're called second basic feathers. And these outer primaries are retained. They're more frayed and faded. Sometimes that contrast is not very easy to see on white wing species like Iceland gull and, and Glaucus gull. 
But on a blackback species like this lesser blackback here, it is very obvious when these things are molting flight feathers. Uh, this thing is undergoing its third pre-basic molt. These are adult-like inner primaries. This is a complete molt. The greater coverts have been dropped. Some tail feathers are being replaced here. Um, and this process, again, takes about six months to replace all of its feathers. And um, the result is basic plumage. So what we're seeing now in the winter season are birds in basic plumage. Overall, we don't see these molt gaps. We don't see this untidiness. They look a lot more uh, spiffy at this time of year. So if, if you're going to take on gulls, winter time is a great time to do it. Not so much the summer when they look ratty and, and disheveled. Um, so just uh, an FYI here, pre-basic molts are complete molts. Pre-alternate molts tend to be partial in gulls. And this is where they're replacing maybe just scapulars or some wing coverts, but not the flight feathers. Takeaway two, a molt cycle aligns with an annual cycle. This usually encompasses one pre-basic molt to the next. When that pre-basic molt begins, we can say the new molt cycle has begun. Um, aging just really fast, a couple of herring gulls here. Um, I'm sure the eye color here is a big giveaway, but the bill pattern is not really telling with things like herring gulls, uh, California gulls, glaucus gulls, because they'll take on these pale bill bases in first cycle. I want you to notice the, the greater covert pattern. So these are pretty plain and muted, whereas in a first cycle, they're going to be a bit more checkered with pale edging. They just look a little more crisp overall. Um, one thing that I often point out on my website is the pointed primary tips are typical of juveniles, and these rounded, more blunt-tipped primaries are typical of older birds, whether it be second cycle, third cycle, or even older. Uh, sometimes it's pretty subtle with white wing gulls. And when I say white wing gulls, I mean things like Iceland gulls, Glaucus gulls, Glaucus winged gulls. Um, this individual on the right is a second cycle Glaucus wing. But notice the primary tips appear pointed, and that's because of that pale edging. It gives it this more, um, this more uh, pointed appearance. And if I saw just these primaries, I might think this was a juvenile. Um, but the juveniles tend to have more patterned tertials, more patterned greater coverts. And we said these second cycles are more muted and plain. Um, Glaucus gull is one of those species that tends to keep an all black bill in first cycle. And so a bill like this in first cycle would be unusual. Um, so um, the bill pattern is helpful in second cycles, but that's to say that there's even some second cycles that keep black bills. These are both glaucus gulls. The one on the left is a first cycle. The one on the right is a second cycle. How would anyone know this? Um, maybe we can compare their primary tips again. There's pointed primary tips on this juvenile and these rounded, more blunt tip primaries on the second cycle. Again, compare the greater coverts here, plain and muted, here more barred and patterned, okay? Um, and if you're seeing this adult-like gray hair, that's kind of useful. Uh, I wouldn't really expect that on a first cycle much. Um, so I know uh, this is a lot and it's, it's, it's late for you guys. It's even later for me, but uh, I couldn't resist but to put this slide in here. This is an Iceland gull. Don't ask me what subspecies. I took this in British Columbia in March a couple years ago. Um, but it's a really pale Iceland gull in March. Whether this is a faded Thayer's gull or Coomlins, who knows? But notice the bill pattern here starts to get pale late in the winter season. Uh, structurally, compared to this Glaucus winged, Glaucus wing just has a much deeper barrel chested body, a broad wing. And when we say broad wing, we mean from the leading edge to the trailing edge. This is a lot of distance here. Okay. Whereas these longer winged, more narrow winged species like California gull, Iceland gull, lesser blackback gull, they tend to have these long hands and more narrow wings, right? Uh, and just overall, this is a smaller bird, but both of these would be classified as white wingers. A confusion pair. Um, somebody actually requested that I talk about second cycle Thayer's. And so here it is. Uh, this second, second, second cycle Thayer's on the right here 
I noticed the the primaries. That's a helpful feature here. They're not really jet black. Sometimes they could be, uh, but they have this pale edging on the primaries, this kind of marbled pattern to the tercels and coverts here. Um, but notice the underside of P10 here, this pale underside to the far wing. Not really going to find that in herring gulls. They tend to be darkish on the underwing. And again, there's that large contrast, this step here from the primaries to the tercels. Um, structurally, I think you can say Thayer's gull appears to be more docile often, more round-headed, um, smaller bill, but a lot of this is sex related, right? If this was, you know, a, a male herring gull, we would expect it to have this flat head, this kind of mean blocky head. Um, if this is a female type Thayer's, it might have a more rounded head, a shorter bill. So a lot of this does depend on sex. Males tend to be bigger, bulkier. Females tend to be smaller, um, up to 20, 30% smaller than their male counterparts. Um, windows is a term I think would be useful to clarify. A lot of people use this and I think they often misuse it and, and, and think of mirrors when they mean windows. So what are windows exactly? This lesser black back on the left does not have a window. Whereas this herring gull on the right is showing a window. So the word window is often reserved for young, large gulls in their first cycle. And it refers to the inner primaries and how pale these can be. So species that don't typically show windows are like lesser blackbacks, California gull. Species that do show windows are things like herring gull, Thayer's gull, uh, short-billed gull. But in addition to the window on this herring gull, notice the dark tail base and notice just how patterned these upper tail coverts are. And for you guys who are seeing more lesser blackbacks now in Los Angeles, I guess um, Los Angeles is the lesser blackback capital of California now, uh, thanks to Andrew Birch, you have a pale tail base and overall just this white ground color to the upper tail coverts. This is a good giveaway. You know, besides the whitish head and, and the long jet black bill, um, take a look at that tail and compare it to things like, you know, um, herring gull and, and, and western gull. So in flight here, if I told you one of these is a lesser blackback gull and one of these is a herring gull, would you be able to make a distinction here? Um, besides just size, I think this is sex related. Look at the window here, the window on the herring and the absence of a window on the lesser blackback. Yes, it's true. Lesser blackbacks are just going to appear more solid brown on the upper parts, but not always. Sometimes they can be more patterned. This one tends to have a pretty dark tail band um, and a tail base actually, but still this, this white base color to the upper tail coverts is, is usually pretty helpful with this younger age group of lesser blackbacks. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I think I'm about 50 minutes in. Uh, I could ramble for another five, 10 minutes, but if somebody wanted to give me a single here, I, I can't yeah. see the chat. You're you're doing fine. Uh, if anyone who loses something here can certainly go back and take a look at the recording and catch up on whatever they need. That's great. So, That's what's so nice about recording these webinars is you can go back, rewind it, fast forward, and just go back and digest this in stages. Um, so at at rest, lesser black back does average a little bit smaller than herring gulls. And um I want you to notice this herring gull on the left, the breast pattern, the underparts tend to be more velvety, more smooth, kind of this washed out look. And these older world taxa like Vega gull, lesser blackback gull, they tend to have a whitish base color, a ground color to the breast hair. And they appear more mealy, more spotted and streaked on the underparts. Um, it's expected that lesser blackback will keep a mostly black bill throughout throughout the non-breeding season. So if you're seeing a bill like this um, in the middle of winter, it's probably not a lesser blackback, right? Um, they also tend to have darker post-juvenile scapulars. So these are really pale first alternate scapulars. Their scapulars tend to be more dark centered or more anchor patterned. But, you know, overall, structurally, 
they appear more svelte, more slim in the back here and longer winged. And I think overall, this is just because they have less body underneath the, the vent region here than say a herring or a Western gull would. Um, I put this here because I do think at some point this might become an identification problem on the Pacific coast where older, lesser blackback gulls might get lost in a flock of Western gulls. Now, fortunately, as they get older, their legs are yellow, um, but take this second cycle lesser blackback on the left here. It looks very adult-like, has a white breast, has a good amount of gray on the back, um, but this is a bird that was banded as a first cycle in Florida. I happen to see it as a first cycle, and then a year later, I happen to see it as a second cycle, so we have life history on this bird. Um, it looks very mature in some ways. It has these replaced tertials with broad white tips. Uh, it's even replaced some greater coverts, these gray greater coverts, and a good amount of these gray um, lesser and median coverts have been replaced. This bird has undergone uh, a good amount of its second pre-alternate molt, second pre-alternate molt. But overall, the head streaking is very different than what you would expect on a Western gull, right? Um, the streaking tends to be long and thin overall. And these Western gulls, even the ones that aren't influenced by glaucous wing gulls, they tend to be more um smudged more blotted looking um this western gull happens to have a pretty small bill and that's why i chose this one for this slide um this is a really small western in fact when i had it next to a hearman's gull it didn't look much bigger than a hearman so i would assume this is a female type western um a question you might have so how do we know this is a third cycle and not say a second cycle for example um, if you zoom in on these secondary tips, you see this white line here? These are the tips to the secondaries, and they're adult-like, and we wouldn't expect this on a second cycle. Um, also, this white tip right here, I got to use my laser for this, this white tip right here, this little white spot, uh, that's a tip to one of the primaries, probably P5 or P6. And we don't see these white tips on the primaries of second cycles, okay? Um, if you look back at this second cycle lesser black back, I don't see these white tips on the secondaries and the primaries all have black tips. So it's pretty safe to assume this thing is uh, a second cycle lesser black back in addition to the band there. Uh, mirrors, mirrors, not too much more terminology, guys, but People read this and they they come to me and they they always confuse mirrors with windows. And so what are mirrors? The bird on the top there has no mirror. The bird in the middle has one mirror on P10. And the bird on the bottom has a mirror on P9 and P10. Do you see these mirrors? They're subterminal white spots. Um, and usually gulls only have mirrors on P9, P10. Um, things like common gull from Europe might have a P8 mirror, but we don't expect mirrors on P8. It's said that these mirrors are, are age related. So as a bird gets older, it's expected that these mirrors get larger. In fact, there was a study done on common gulls in Europe where they found um, birds at the height of their reproductive stage, somewhere in their middle of their lives had the largest mirrors. Uh, and then they regressed and got a little bit smaller in size as they, as they got older and, and ready to perish. Uh, these are all Thayer's gulls, by the way. Very, very intricate patterns on the wingtip. Uh, I want to point out something called the Thayer, the Thayer eye pattern, the Thayer's pattern. And this is something that you find on the ninth primary. This is P9, okay? And this is P10 here. On P9, what you'll see in some subspecies is the mirror will merge with the inner web. And so this continuous white here is called a Thayer eye pattern. And this bird here is aspiring to have a Thayer eye pattern. It has a nice P9 mirror. And there's a break in the black hair. It's trying to merge and form a Thayer eye pattern. Whereas this Thayer's on the top here um, has a black medial band. It does not show a Thayer eye pattern. In fact, the P9 mirror is broken at the shaft here. It's not even a complete mirror. But um, just terminology for people who are interested in this sort of thing. This gray hair on the inner web is called a tongue. 
this gray tongue will sometimes merge with the mirror and form what's called a Thayeri pattern. All right. Um, so Thayer's tends to show less black in the wingtip than things like herring gulls and California gulls, obviously. Um, and it does qualify as a white wing gull. And that's because when you look at the underside of the primaries, uh, it tends to have very limited pigmentation on the underwing. Uh, everyone's favorite these days, slatyback gulls, show extensive variation in their wingtip pattern. Both of these are slatyback gulls. Um, the one on the left has a P10 mirror that has taken over the whole primary tip. And the one on the left also has a Thayeri pattern on P9. Um, these white spots here we call string of pearls. Uh, these are called tongue tips and they're forming these nice pearls. But this slaty back on the right tends to have uh, all black on P9, very little mirror here on or a tongue tip on P8. Um, this is the type of slaty back gull that might get overlooked in a flock of Western gulls. And uh, Andrew had an interesting bird yesterday that at first glance looks a lot like a slaty back gull. Now I would imagine if it had this wing tip as an adult, we may overlook it and just call it a Western gull. The nice thing about slaty back gulls in the winter season, when we see them, they often have these streaky heads and that's a nice giveaway. Um, but also, I want to point out um, something to think about with these slatyback gulls is on the inner primaries here, notice how this white kind of eats into the feather shaft on the inner primaries. There's this white indentation here. This was first pointed out by Peter Adrians a few years ago. Um, and when you compare it to things like great blackback herring hybrids and western gulls, they tend not to have that white indentation eat into the feather shaft. Um, this is a Western gull, by the way. Notice it has yellowish legs. So you're seeing this twice in one night where a, a Western gull has yellowish legs. Um, but if if you would, the string of pearls on the slaty back gull, these, these white pearls here, are not things you're going to see on slaty, uh, on Western gulls or even Western, um, Western glaucus wing hybrids will rarely show this amount of white on the tongue tips, all right? Um, but the broad trailing edge is something that's shared by both slaty back and Western gull. And that's not so much true of things like lesser black backs and great black backs. They tend to have those uh, more narrow trailing edge to the inner primaries. Um, I'll probably end with this, I think. Uh, you have a ring-billed gull that's perched here and when a bird is perched like this, these white spots that you're seeing here, these are the very, very tips to the primaries. They're not mirrors. They're the apicals or apicals, okay? Uh, these mirrors, P10 mirror, P9 mirror, you're, you're often not seeing these on the perched bird because the way the feathers are folded is such that these mirrors are concealed on the folded wing. So these white spots that you're seeing, again, are the very, very tips of the primaries, and they're not mirrors, okay? Uh, gray tongue here, gray tongue. This is a gray tongue, and on some species, we would expect a white tongue tip, a white crescent here, or a white pearl. Uh, with that, I think we have put out enough jargon. I hope you uh, have some things to add to your gull-watching lexicon. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some questions. Uh, I could go on and ramble for probably another hour with terminology, but I did want to share some things this evening that I think uh, a lot of gall talks tend to avoid, and probably for good reason. If you're asleep by now, I apologize, but <laughs> you know, it's it's these nuanced topics that I think take people from just being casual observers to people who can become more serious about gall watching. And from looking at past webinars, um, I, I, I didn't see any that touched on these topics. So I wanted to put this out there to have in your in your archives. So I hope it's, it's beneficial to your audience. It is, and it was, and it shall be. Yes, thank you very, <laughs> very much. And yeah, that's one. That's the magic of being able of recording these webinars and having them to go back to and 
some of our webinars uh, have been viewed literally thousands of times. And I'm sure most of that is when it comes to dowagers, just me going back and read, looking at certain <laughs> things and all that. Yes, that was excellent. Thank you yes. very, Ryan, very, very, much. very good. I Thank have to admit, so much. I have to admit, I go in there and I watch some of those webinars because there's just some great information on taxonomy and um, it's just some of the richest stuff that you can find on these on these online birding webinars. So thank you for for having those. Yeah, well, great. Well, welcome. And thank you for for thank contributing you. and adding yet another one that people will go back to for for quite a long time. Abs absolutely, absolutely. And we are getting lots and lots of great comments. Um, if you have a question for Amar, or for any of us actually, but mostly for Amar, please put it into the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. That helps us to keep track of them, make sure that we haven't uh, missed anything. Yeah. Um, Andy, do you have anything uh, that you pops to mind? Uh, there's, there's questions coming in. I, I, I don't think I can actually type my question in. So Oh, no, you can't. I'll you leave have it to Amar answer. to decide what order he wants to do them in. I, I, I think I know where Amar stands on this, but um, just because the, the latest Adrienne's Gull book, you, you know, deals with the Thayer's Gull taxonomy. And as everyone's probably aware, it, it used to be a species and now it's not. And um, the Adrienne's recent Gull book sort of stands firm that maybe the the lumping of it was too um too sudden and didn't have all the information available etc and i wondered what uh, mars would you care to expound on that publicly what you feel about it and how it will be treated in your book yeah so um Thayer's is going to be treated as a subspecies of iceland gull um but i have a long commentary in the book on um Nobody really knows, you know, we can go with the AOS for now and, and say there is fragmented data and there's not enough information to really make an informed decision. Um, I, living on the Great Lakes, see Iceland gulls that, you know, span from the darkest stairs to sometimes birds with all white wingtips that match nominate glaucoides. They're pretty rare, but we get a lot of intermediate birds and, and you know, the saying of, uh, you stand where you sit, you sit where you stand. That That's kind of where I'm at with this, where I've seen um, so many intermediate individuals that don't fit the mold of typical St. John's Coomlin's gulls or typical, you know, uh, Pacific Coast Thayer's gulls. So I think there is something going on in the Arctic. I don't know that we have enough data to say that there's large scale interbreeding. In fact, all the data suggests that everybody who's been at a breeding grounds has never really taken the time to, to outline their identification criteria for what is a Thayer's and what is a Kumlin's gull and how do we separate them and where do we draw the line in the sand? Um, so, so my personal take is a lot more liberal now than it was say two, three years ago, where now I think, you know, anybody who says they know for a fact what's happening with the Iceland complex is just kind of reaffirming their own biases. So um, it is treated as a subspecies of Iceland gull in the book, um, but it gets its own complete chapter with all its identification criteria, range map, and and um, there is a section uh, on intermediate types that that I have in the book, which I think people will find really interesting. Thank you. Can't wait. Well Great, um, great. How does you. it work with the Q and A? Do you do you do those, Mark? Or? Yeah. So I I, I was going to read the question because we have a a bunch of people on YouTube that can't see the questions, and um, people listening to the recording don't uh, don't see the uh, questions. So I was going to read those uh, out loud. And apparently, we have a, quite a large following on YouTube today. Um, mm -hmm. That that that. Uh, Somebody suggests maybe uh, maybe some of your high school students. Uh, That's fun. fantastic. Um, so Naresh asks, uh, speaking of confusing species and identification problems, what would be your approach to identifying large Thayer's gulls versus herring glaucous winged hybrids on the West Coast? 
Um, yeah, so I, I was just just today, Liam Singh and I, Liam Singh lives on Vancouver Island. He sees a lot of these hybrids and a lot of Thayer's gulls, probably more than anyone else I know. <laughs> and even he's tripped up um, almost weekly by the occasional Cook Inlet hybrid. And Cook Inlet hybrid is just Glaucus wing herring versus Thayer's gull. Um, there's a very interesting phenomenon on the West Coast where some people in Oregon, I won't mention any names, tend to have this very conservative approach for what Thayer's can look like. And um, they accept these pretty bulky Thayer's and these well-patterned Thayer's. Um, so if the question is, what's my approach on identifying first cycles or adults? Because those are two different questions. I can answer both. Mm -hmm. With the first cycles, um, any anything that's showing extensive post-juvenile molt in the scapulars is probably not a Thayer's if it's showing it early on in the season. Um, but size uh, says a lot. If there's this girth to the bill in a first cycle bird, it's probably not a Thayer's. Um, but again, this might be this, this circular reasoning where we keep identifying small Thayer's in fear of, of misidentifying some hybrids. Uh, as far as the larger adults, um, the adults are a little bit easier. They tend to have um, orbital ring color that's more pinkish yellow. It's kind of this obscure color. It's not the nice vivid pink that you would see on Thayer's. But also the wingtip tends to be messier on the hybrids. Um, so they have this kind of diffuse pattern on the base of P8 and P9. It's not as nice and, and demarcated as many adult Thayer's gulls. Size, size is, is, is number one. I would say probably the biggest tip off to begin with is, is size. But, you know, there's that, there's that problem with, are we avoiding large Thayer's because we think they're hybrids? Yeah. yeah. Great, great. Thank cool. you. Um, Maxwell asks, uh, can I ask what a wing panel is? Um, I see it mentioned a lot on detailed gull ID write-ups, but it's not clear to me what it is. So are you guys still able to see my slide here with this juvenile lesser blackback? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, so I'm going to trace the wing panel. It's just the wing coverts here. So it's a combination of lesser coverts, median coverts, and greater coverts. That's the wing panel on the perch bird. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, Mark asks, uh, is there any theory regarding why yellow-footed gull is the only large white-headed three-cycle gull? Perhaps the recent genetic studies that suggest some relation between hermans and yellow-footed, despite the obvious differences in appearance, have some bearing. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I don't have... Uh... A good answer for that. Um, but one thing we recently found in Peruvian populations of kelp gull, which tend to be residents, um, they also undergo this extensive pre-alternate molt in first and second cycle. And within three years, we found um, they become adult-like. And so it's, it's exactly what's happened with yellow-footed gulls, which are also resident for the most part. They're not migrants. Um, so maybe it has something to do with um, being able to do this and 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 speed up the process and get breeding faster than you need to as a four-year species. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Ken asks, the last slide with ring-billed gall, the legs are confusing because I have yet to see an orangish, orangish ring bill gull leg color in Sacramento area. So the leg colors change with season. Um, was it, let's, do you have a slide number, Ken, or roughly where in the presentation? Last this is slide. The last slide. Hmm. So, so we would be here. That one. I think that one. Yeah, so um, similar to how Western gull gets these very hyper vivid colored bear parts, there are uh, ring-billed gulls at the onset of the breeding season, April-ish, May-ish, that get these very, very bright colored legs. Um, I've seen some that um, are literally orange, orange, the color of an orange. Hmm. Uh, 
they're they're rare some of those who have those orange bare parts will also show like a pink blush to the breast and head um but if if i had to guess you know with the white head and a very very bright orange legs here i would say this is probably april on this ring build gull ken mm -hmm. okay great cool. but, um, uh, to, to completely answer that question once you get into mid-july onward those bare parts those leg colors and, and bill colors start to get duller okay so they do transform into more dull color mm -hmm. um, and that's when that's when that bird would be in low breeding condition mm -hmm. cool great yeah um another question is why is the increase in lesser blackback gulls in the west um so first of all, I, th I think it's a east to west expansion. There's some people who suspect we have lesser blackback gulls coming from Russia and Asia now, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, if it were the case, I think we would see sightings in places like the Bering Sea, uh, Nome, perhaps even like you know Southeast Alaska and Vancouver Island, but that's not the case at all. If you map their expansion over the last 20, 25 years, it's been east to west from say the gulf coast of texas the colorado front range the salton sea um but i think what's happening is lesser blackbacks are onto our landfills um mm -hmm. and you know some people think this is comical but one of the only things that holds these large gulls for much of the non-breeding season are the landfills especially in the interior um it, it's not so much the the marine life um lesser blackback gulls in their biggest numbers are found in places like Volusia county florida where you can find several hundred at a single landfill uh bucks county pennsylvania where you can find seven eight hundred of them now um mainly just just holding themselves on landfill food over the winter so i think um with with our landfill practices a lot of lesser blackback gulls are moving as we speak. Um, literally from year to year, you might have a big cluster, say in Northern Illinois, and then the next year they're not there if there's any type of disruption in the landfills. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what they're doing is just moving throughout the interior and they're finding more and move, more food sources. Mm -hmm. hmm. okay. That's interesting. Um, let's see, uh, Gregory, uh, says uh, S. Let's see. After coming back from the Salton Sea, I noticed that Bonaparte's gulls seem to be dramatically more common in the northern half of the sea. Do you know why this might be? Assuming it wasn't wasn't just unique to the day I went. Hmm. Um. So so maybe more uh, insects that that were that had hatched in the northern part of the sea. Uh, maybe just the, the the depth of the water. Um, I've seen this too, you know, in, in just a small lake by my house where the Bonapartes are more active on one part of the lake than the other. It could be just whatever it is they're following, whatever insect it is they're feeding on, uh, is just a large hatch or a fly day for, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Gregory has another question. Um, there's no problem, might not be any records in California, but any tips for distinguishing common gull versus short build gull just in case one shows up <laughs> yeah so again a, a two-part question if it's adults if it's adults the wingtip uh the wingtip is is probably the most important with uh short build gull having these these much longer gray tongues and shorter subterminal bands on the inner the outer primaries um common gull tends to have a lot more black on the outer hand and, and larger P9 mirror. Um, the trailing edge on adult common gulls tends to be very broad on the secondaries. And then as you get to the primaries, it tapers off to where it's almost non-existent. So it goes from mm -hmm. thick trailing edge on the secondaries and then very thin trailing edge to the inner primaries. On most short-billed gulls, it's thick trailing edge on the secondaries and a somewhat thick trailing edge on the inner primaries. But the wingtip would be one, the smudged head on short build, very smooth smudge pattern compared to the dotted pattern on common gull. 
mm -hmm. um, is one. And common gall is just going to be a little bit paler. But, you know, those those gray upper parts always come down to is this variation in short build gall? Do I just have a short build gall that's pale or dark? Um, the wingtip, I think, first, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Any more questions? I'm seeing we're, we're out of them on the Q&A at the moment. And I don't see any in the chat. Um, Andy, do you have any follow up? that you'd like to ask? I don't, I thank you very, very much. Uh, just seeing all the notifications in the chat. I mean, we actually had a massive turnout. Right? <laughs> yeah, we had a, we had a, a much the... larger turnout than normal and and a huge turnout. Janet tells me there was a huge turnout on the, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, YouTube, YouTube, which uh, she's monitoring. Which, which I think well, speaks volumes to Amar's reputation because exactly get that many people to show up for goals is incredible and <laughs> the best attended webinars we've had i do see guy mccaskey in the chat here i do see the name and, and i just have to say hi guy uh it's been a long time and thank you for attending um and um just thank you for being such an inspiration to to every one of us absolutely yeah absolutely and uh i we will look forward to the book. Can't wait. I know. We I'm... look forward. What, what's the time scale on the book? Um, so I, I hope to have a publication date in the next couple months here. But we're working our tails off. Princeton is 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 busy at work with production and design right now. Mm -hmm. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, definitely looking forward to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, Amar, thank you very, very much for a wonderful, wonderful webinar, something that will become um, very important, I think, as as birds change and as gulls change through into the onto the West Coast. Um, I think we'll appreciate uh, this uh, webinar more and more. Well, thank thank you, you again. I appreciate the invite. And uh, please uh, join us in a couple of weeks for Ted Kyle and uh, Dark Raptors. And God, it sounds like a yeah. Saturday afternoon TV show. I used to watch Dark Raptors. Yeah, but anyways. And, yeah. and, and also, if you uh, like gulls, Andy is leading a uh, gull field trip on uh, January 7th. Absolutely. It's going to be fantastic. So watch your email. If you're not a member, of LA Birders, please join so that you get those emails and can sign up for these events. And yeah. with that, thank you thank again, you. Amar. That was really an excellent thanks, guys. I appreciate of many key yeah. points. You gave us a vocabulary about how to talk about goals. I really appreciate. Yeah. It. Yes. Hope you guys can go back and watch it in stages if needed. Absolutely, absolutely. With that, thank you all very much, and we will see you at next uh, event or webinar. And again, thank you, Amar, and thank you, Andy, and we'll see you all next time. Take care. Thank you, Amar. Yep, you bet. Take care. Take care, everyone.